Hello everyone and welcome back to Foundational JavaScript. I'm Gray Lewis. Um, today we're going to be tackling one of the more difficult concepts to wrap your head around in I'd say JavaScript as a whole and maybe even programming as a whole. And that is because it goes directly against some of the most core intuitions that we've built up about how programming works, about the order of operations um, that code is executed in. And it, it really just, it, it is counterintuitive. Um, and uh, yes, this topic is asynchronous code, um, which you, you may or may not be familiar with or have seen in some context. Um, but today I wanna talk you through what asynchronous code aims to accomplish um, and what, how it differs from the typical ways that we expect code to execute. So typically when we're writing code, um, especially in JavaScript, we expect it to be synchronous. And what that means is that it's going to go uh, instruction by instruction. It's going to say, uh, do task A. Then once we're done with task A, move on to task B. And then once we're done with task B, move on to task C, and etc. But on the web, we have this uh, interesting challenge where sometimes resources uh, can, uh, need to be fetched, um, especially API calls or maybe even downloading images, for example. Um, and we need to be able to do things in the meantime while those tasks are being completed. So let's say that task one is just to render the page, um, and but task two is to go fetch some uh, extra image and insert it into the page. We don't want the web page to be completely unresponsive in the time that we're going and fetching that image. And essentially that's what asynchronous code aims to do. So rather than saying, okay, line by line, we're gonna execute it, it's going to allow us to um, avoid what is called blocking code. Um, and you know, fetching that image would be an example of what could be blocking code. So if a line of code is gonna take a long time to execute, um, then we don't want that to block what is called the event loop in JavaScript. Um, and the event loop is essentially, you can think of it as a a queue of tasks, right? So it's going to feed in this um, list of tasks into the event loop, um, and the event loop is gonna handle them one by one. And that's important because in JavaScript, we want to be able to be assured that things are gonna be done in the order that we need them. We can't be, um, a con we can't be running code that requires some data that we're fetching before we have that data or we're gonna have an error thrown. So on a computer, as you're probably familiar with, we have this idea of threading or uh, CPU threads. And what that means is that the computer is doing all of these calculations, um, but it's not just doing it on one single processor, really. Even though we call it a central processing unit, that central processing unit actually has multiple threads, each of which are capable of handling um, tasks simultaneously. and um, technically speaking, JavaScript is actually single threaded, which means that tasks are actually ex executed in a somewhat synchronous way. And that's where the, this idea of the event loop comes in. We are feeding one event at, the, at a time into the event loop, and that needs to be executed before we can move on to the next task. However, asynchronous features basically give us a workaround for this. Um, and this is essentially how it works, right? So we have what is essentially what we're gonna call the event loop, right? The, the function is being accomplished and we're going down through the, the, the function and accomplishing everything. But instead of saying, okay, this long task, let's go back to the example of fetching an image, this blocking task, um, we're going to just sort of put that somewhere else, right? So we have a separate API, a web API, that's going to handle that task for us. In the meantime, we're gonna move on, right? Like this is no longer part of the event loop in a way. We're moving on to the next task. And then once that's done, we can insert a new task into the event loop to handle that data that has come back from this external API, this external function um, that is handling that long, that blocking task for us. So this is essentially the fundamental concept behind asynchronous code. Um, but we're going to actually have to change the way that we write code to handle that. Um, because what we want to do is we need to be able to um, handle data as it comes in. It's always gonna be coming in at a different speed based on internet speed, 
based on a whole number of factors. And we need to be able to react to that data coming back from this other function. And that is where the next couple lessons are going to take us. We're going to see how we can write code that's able to um, handle a, a sort of a task instruction set that looks sort of like this, um, where the code can be interrupted almost. Um, and move on and then return back to this other task that we need to handle um, asynchronously. All right, so uh, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Like I said, this, uh, this I think is one of the more difficult things to wrap your head around. And especially for me, I really had a difficult time uh, grasping what asynchronous code even was. Uh, and it took me a lot of uh, time to get familiar with it. Um, but hopefully that was a somewhat useful explanation for you. So today I hope to illustrate that a little more clearly using some code as an example. And the, uh, the main way in JavaScript that you'll be uh, writing asynchronous code is through a construct called a promise. Um, and we can, we can simply define a promise like this. So normally uh, when you create some... Um, when you create some variable, we are required to have some actual value uh, to declare it to. Um, or, I mean, we could also un initialize an, uh, an empty variable, but this actually allows us to assign a value that says this value is undefined now, but later it will have a value. Um, and I, I, that is, I know, so, so abstract to think about, but. Uh, I think it'll make a little more sense in a second. So in the promise constructor here, we have a, we are passing an arrow function that takes two parameters, the resolve parameter and the reject parameter. And essentially these correspond to a successful, um, uh, a successful uh, fetching of data or a unsuccessful fetching of data or, you know, completion of a task, right? So if we reject, we're essentially throwing an error. And if we resolve, we are saying, all's well, this variable now contains the data that we would expect it to. So timer here is a promise that uh, in the future will either be resolved to a value or rejected and have an error thrown. So let's, uh, let's do a little example here. Um, I'm going to basically do a little set timeout function that's just going to wait three um, seconds and then just, you know, pass on the message that the time that the timer has expired. So the value here after the timeout function times out will be timer expired. So all we have to do to react to this, um, to react to this promise being resolved. And that's the key here, right? Is that with asynchronous data flow, instead of having some predictable set of, um, like it's going to be A, then B, then C. What we're setting up is um, we are going to perform a certain function after this value is resolved. Somewhat like a callback, right? We can also, using callbacks is a, another form of asynchronous code in a way, um, where we're going to wait until one function is completed and then use the output from that function and do something with that. And it's fine, it, that, that first function can take as long as it needs to complete because the second function will not run until that first, that first function is done. This gives us, this is somewhat similar to the idea of a callback, but it gives us a much cleaner syntax. Um, and it also allows us to think of it in terms of a little, a, a little more strictly in terms of data, right? Because we're assigning a variable. So it's a variable with a promised value. There will be a value here later. And to access that value at a later time, all we do is we call the dot then method. And uh, this is a little bit strange of a syntax with the tab here that we're adding and the lack of semicolon here, but this is generally the syntax that we use for calling multiple methods in a row. So I'm going to pass the then um, method on the timer promise variable, um, an arrow function. And in that arrow function, all I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in the result and I'm going to call console log it. It's pretty simple. Um, and then all we have to do is simply run the code and we shall see that what we expect to happen is that uh, there will be a timeout set after that timeout is resolved. And you can imagine, for example, that instead of it being a set timeout function, it could be um, uh, fetching some data off a server or making some API request. 
And then once that result is back from that promise, we're gonna we're gonna log that value. So let's just run that. We see it's waiting a few seconds. And then bam, after the first value is resolved, the timer expires, and we are given that exact result that we would expect. And so you can see how this can sort of be, well, this is a super simple example. This forms a building block on which we can build much more complex logic, asynchronous logic that allows us to handle complex flows of data um, that might not necessarily be super predictable um, and, uh, and handle that appropriately. So um, as we were talking about, callbacks are essentially how we are used to handling asynchronous um, data flow. When we are running a function and we're not sure in which, let's say for example, we're running three separate functions, each of which um, is going to return some data back after an unspecified amount of time. And we're not exactly sure maybe in which order those are going to, those instructions are going to be completed. Um, but we need to have a certain order of operations to then react to that data and perform operations with that data. Um, we are used to using callbacks for that. So we might um, fetch something and then provide a function to that. We, we have a function that fetches something and provide as a, a parameter to that fetch function, a callback function, which would be run with the data that that fetch, fun fetch function returned as a parameter and then it can do something with that data. Um, but then once we get to more complex level operations where maybe we need to chain together several callbacks, so do this, then do this, then do this, but we need to also be doing other operations in the meantime, promises allow us to really cleanly provide that functionality. Um, so in the abstract, that sounds quite complex, but I'm going to demonstrate it here for you now and hopefully that will make it easier to understand. Um, so. We have here a fake API that I have mocked up for the sake of this demonstration. Uh, it is an imaginary e-commerce website in which there are users um, in a database and those uh, users all have a certain amount of products attached to their profile. So first we're going to uh, create a, a function which will get the data for a given user. Then we're going to handle that data and then we're going to use that data to look up the, pro the products that that user has uh, on their profile. And then we are going to console log that data uh, just for a quick demo. So um, we talked about last time um, how to define a new promise like this. Const promise equals new promise with, that, um, with this sort of uh, syntax here. But also a lot, of, um, a lot of different functions are built to already return promises. So we don't even necessarily have to create our own promises. Um, and, and node fetch is a really good example of that. So node fetch is a library which is going to be able to make HTTP requests to online servers and return that data for us. Um, and they use the promise, uh, uh, the, the promise system uh, to, to handle that. So if we go ahead and fetch this API URL, um, and we're going to uh, insert as well the endpoint on that API that we're going to be hitting. So we see here we are going to the user endpoint, and then we are looking up a user with the specific ID. Um, uh, then this will return a promise. And since it's a promise, we all we have to do to handle the data coming back from that promise is use a dot then. And it's pretty simple. We just take the response, we pipe that in using an arrow function to a uh, function which will parse that response and turn it into a JSON object for us to use. Then we pass another then, uh, pretty simply, and we accept the actual user object as the parameter for that arrow function. And we can uh, quickly just to check, now console log uh, that user, and let's, let's see how that goes. It takes a moment and then we see indeed we have returned the user with the ID one um, with the name Natalie Kupfal. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's that simple to, to, to handle this asynchronous data flow. Um, and then we can even chain even more than, uh, than statements to handle looking up the products that the user has. So 
let's say we just want to um, let's say we just want to go ahead and fetch that user's products. Um, it's pretty simple. We pass in the user object that we have. We use their ID to fill in the URL to properly point our fetch function to the right endpoint at the right user. Um, and we use the product endpoint to tell the API that we want a list of the products that they have attached to their profile. And you can see how I'm dynamically building these URLs using template literal syntax, which we've talked about before. And then uh, once more, we're going to have to do the same thing and uh, res.json that response to parse it into a JavaScript object. And then we can just go ahead and um, console log the products that we fetched. So now let's note index.js once more. And we shall see that indeed, it's as simple, it's simple uh, to just keep chaining these then, these then statements and easily uh, get exactly the data we need. Um, and this is all non-blocking. As we talked about in the first lesson, we could be handling other tasks in the meantime. We could even be fetching other resources in the meantime because we've essentially created an instruction set um, that, that can just be inserted into that event loop as the data comes in. Um, and then we could even have another set of, of, of fetch functions right below here. And we wouldn't need to wait for this code to be done executing to move on to code down here. And that's really the power of it. And there are also a few utility functions that are offered for dealing with promises as part of, uh, by default in JavaScript. Um, most importantly, promise.all. And I'm going to demonstrate how we would use that now. So let's imagine that there is three pieces of data, um, three users that we need to fetch um, before we can handle that data. Um, well, in that case, we would need to somehow combine all three of these promises into one big promise uh, that we could attach a then method to to consume that data afterwards. Um, and there's a pretty simple way to do that with the dot all function, as I mentioned before. So what we have here is we're going to quickly fetch uh, three different users here. And then we are going to have to, as before, handle uh, parsing that response. And uh, we are going to attach that to all three of these users. And then now we have three promises that are going to eventually resolve to user objects. And then well, all we have to do is use the promise.all function, which accepts uh, an array of promises as a uh, it's only parameter. So we have user one, user two, and user three all in an array. And then this will return a promise that we can then attach a then function to, um, to, to, handle, to handle those responses all at once. Um, so I'm gonna now console log those objects. And you'll see, indeed, we now have three, an array of three different objects um, that are, uh, uh, have, have all completed before the console.log function is done. So um, what did we talk about today overall? We talked about how we can chain together then uh, methods to actually handle asynchronous data flow and uh, avoid using you know nested callbacks over and over again um, and you can see how this is a pretty clean syntax right it almost looks like normal step-by-step um, -step code and it's quite readable especially with you know it's just fetch and then take the response and then take the JSON from the response and then once all the promises are done then you know it has a certain readability to it, it has a certain structure to it that's really clean and easy to understand and this is why uh, promises are really the preferred way to handle asynchronous data in JavaScript. Um, and there's one more important thing that I need to mention, and that is the dot catch uh, method. So sometimes um, maybe there's something malformed in the request, or uh, maybe for some reason the promise isn't able to resolve. In that case, we need to be able to handle that error. And this is exactly how we do it. We just attach a uh, dot catch after all of our dot then methods and we are able to take the error as a parameter in our arrow function and handle that how we want maybe we throw it maybe we log it to the console etc
So the combination of uh, then and promise.all and catching uh, really provides most of the tools that you'll ever need for handling asynchronous data flow. And you will be working with these a lot um, if you're doing anything related to web apps, because you know we're gonna have typically uh, in, a, in a modern web app structure, a back end and a front end, which are disconnected and talk to each other through uh, using some a library like node fetch. Um, and in that case, you're going to want to have a clean way to write it out and handle that data. And as we said before, there is this, this problem where we need to be able to handle data as it comes back. And this is exactly how we do that. We just have one small little syntactical thing that I, I want to add on. So as we've talked about, um, promises allow us to handle things asynchronously. Um, but sometimes it gets a little um, frustrating to have all of those then statements and catch statements and it's not really clearly delineated when there's a bunch of different promises and it gets a little complicated. And uh, JavaScript offers us this nice little feature called async functions which allows uh, to make which lets us make that process a little cleaner and it allows us to handle these asynchronous jobs in a isolated function so we can sort of maintain the synchronous nature of the rest of our code so to declare an asynchronous function all we have to do is use the async keyword before the function keyword and uh, now what I'm going to be doing is uh, I'm going to re rewrite the same process that we had before for fetching a user from this fake API that we've mocked up, but I'm going to put it in the form of a function so that we could fetch any user we wanted. Um, and you can see how that that's a slightly more powerful way to handle um, writing uh, to handle writing that code, and it's much more reusable. Um, in addition to having a slightly cleaner syntax, thanks to the async function syntactical sugar that we're offered. So. In async functions, we have this nice keyword called await. So if I was to create a fun uh, I, if I was to declare a variable called response or res, uh, I can then assign that to the fetch function as such. And instead of doing a dot then statement, it's just going to assign it wait before this code this wait for this function to complete um, before moving on. Now you do have to understand that under the hood this is exactly the same. This does not become blocking code. This is the exact same under the hood, um, which is really powerful for us. Um, and, and instead of being, uh, basically what, what, what this means is that the function itself um, becomes the sort of asynchronous aspect. So we're running pieces of this function piece by piece. Um, and instead of being blocking because it would be at the top level, it's just going to sort of dress up essentially the same logic um, with this nice syntax that looks a little more synchronous and it's just a little more familiar. And then as before, we need to process that response using the res.json function, and then we can just console log the user. And then all we have to do is use that function. Let's get the first user. And if we go ahead, we'll see that it works just perfectly. And so you can see how when you have a big web app um, this sort of provides us a really clean syntax for handling asynchronous code. Um, and it also allows us to hand, use this await keyword to keep our, um, our, our function, our syntax for writing the code quite simple, right? So instead of having multiple lines for handling this processing, it's just res equals await. Um, instead of having to do all the promise logic that we're used to having to write when we want to do asynchronous code. So if you understood everything, uh, from these lessons in section six, then you are officially done with the asynchronous content for this course. And I am very uh, proud of you <laughs> for sticking through because, I mean, maybe it was different for you. Maybe this was simple for you to grasp. But for me, asynchronous code was definitely one of the more difficult concepts to wrap my head around when I was learning. So, yeah, uh, thank you so much for sticking with me. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out on edgeonix.com. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.